Hello and welcome to this video and this video is called 70s Funk Part 2 Disco. Right, I want to deal with disco. I love disco. Right, and anyone who's watched this channel may have think, well, may think, well Andy, he's not going to like disco. He doesn't, doesn't like all that Fusac stuff that happened. I don't. And I think that's the misinterpretation of disco on Jazz Fusion. But let's just back up to the last video, just in case you haven't watched that. We, we looked at James Brown and how he invented the funk, and then we looked at Sly and the Family Stone, how he brought in the more psychedelic uh, elements into it, and then we looked at George Clinton and how he brings in the sort of icon iconography of funk, you know, that sort of um, black science fiction thing, right? And there's the groundworks of funk. We talked about the other founding artists like Gil Scott, Aaron Curtis Mayfield, Stevie Wonder, and then we really looked at P-Funk, and we looked at a lot of P-Funk spin-off bands. Um, no funk is in touched, untouched by P-Funk in the 70s. And as that grows, it becomes much more commercial. And certain bands start to become really popular in the world of funk. It's almost like they're going beyond funk. And one album that I pulled up, and I didn't talk that much about, was Earth, Wind & Fire. So Earth, Wind & Fire start off as uh, a jazz fusion band. Um, but... I think what happens, and I've been told this by Narada Michael Walden, if you check out my interview with him, is that um, in the early 70s, Jazz Fusion was as a commercial entity and bands got signed and they, they um, were able to be quite exploratory in what they were doing. But as time went on, they, the record company wanted to sign, see hit, hits from them. Um, this happened across the board. If you think of a band like Journey, or even Toto, they start off as fusion bands. Journey's quite a heavy fusion band. But then the record companies say, you know, you need to write some hits. This happened to Narada Michael Walden. You know, his first album is a jazz fusion masterpiece, Garden of Love Light. And then the, uh, the, the um, record company says, we need to see some hits. Now, with a band like Earth, Wind & Fire, I think they just naturally gravitate to writing incredible pop songs. And tracks like Fantasy, September, Shining Star are just brilliant pop records. On this best of, we've actually got, got a, their cover version of Got To Get You Into My Life by The Beatles. And I think that's the key thing here. Is you take some of that Beatles songwriting and you drop it into the funk. right? And it's, it becomes so much more commercial. And they start to have hit records. Okay, Now... What happens with disco, and I'm not going to represent that here with my album choices, but it has to be mentioned, is the other element that comes in actually comes in from, sort of from progressive rock. It's the electronic experimentation, especially craft work. Right? So if you take craft work and, and put it together, you get Giorgio Moroder, you get um, Donna Summer. Right? And that starts to create a new sound. Um, is, is disco funk, it, it's, it's, it's an offshoot of funk, but it's different. Disco is a lot more commercial, it's a lot more based upon a simpler pulse, it hasn't got the syncopation of funk, uh, it's a lot more um, song based, and a lot more rooted in uh, electronica, you know, um, and this it starts to have an effect. Now, I'm not going to talk about that because I know this channel is, is, is really about jazz fusion but i think as the sales of the jazz fusion albums start to wane in the 70s the record companies come and say you need to have a hit record and those musicians look around and they go well what's happening well it's disco right you've got to understand that funk is actually a part of jazz fusion it's in there not right from the beginning but almost from the beginning and the fusion musicians have almost pioneered this in themselves you know people like herbie hancock People like George Duke, people like Billy Cobham, people like the Brecker Brothers have all really pioneered and added to the history of funk, right? And the smoothing of the beats, the, um, the simplification, you know, the, of, of disco um, then starts to get fed back. And I think the reason why the influence of disco can be so horrific on jazz fusion is because many of the musicians don't understand it. Those that do do it very, very well, okay? Um, but we can also see on disco the influence of fusion, and I'll hopefully get to that by the end of this video to prove that that's the case. Right, so disco emerges around about 76, 77. Um, it's the soundtrack to one of the biggest films of the 70s. The Bee Gees, you know, go from a sort of um, 60s folky song-based band to becoming a disco band. 
1977 and they contribute to the soundtrack of Saturday Night Fever which I have got and I should have pulled it out really uh, and that becomes a, a huge hit you know so there's now we've got a hit film uh, you know we've got specific clubs in New York um, which are becoming the place for trendy people to go to we got we got hit records happening um, now this music emerges now I feel that that disco is different to fusion because it's a completely hedonistic form. All right, so um, funk albums, they're conceptual. You know, if you go and put a, a P funk album, there's a political stance to it, there's a conceptual stance to it, um, there's some incredible playing on it. You can sit and listen to those, you don't have to just, just, just dance them, you can listen to them. You know, Gil Scott Heron, Curtis Mayfield, there's a heaviness to it. Disco, that starts to go and we, we, we're just pure hedonism. Um, now, um, I have argued elsewhere that punk is, was not the great changer of fusion and progressive rock. Punk almost comes out of those styles, especially Brit British punk really comes out of um, uh, British prog. I believe that that style is an extension of uh, prog. The real nemesis, in a way, of, of fusion and prog, especially fusion in America, is disco. Uh, and disco is a little bit like punk is to prog, disco is to fusion. So um, it's threatening the fusion bands, all right? But it's also dripping with all the stuff that's in there. It's exactly like punk, you know. Punk has so many elements from prog, the sort of in English aesthetic, the do-it-yourself nature, you know, that all these things are in there. Even some of the imagery, you know, you can see uh, links between, you know, John Lydon, and you can see the links to that to Ian Anson from Jethro Tull. You know, there's a they're reacting against it, but because they're reacting against it, it's coming out of this. Disco is not a reaction against fusion because it's it's in a way completely mindless. It just emerges and it's popular, right? It doesn't care about fusion. None of the artists are going to um, do a John Lydon and wear a, um, you know, we hate weather report like they did with Pink Floyd. This isn't going to happen. So um, disco just comes out and changes the nature of it, okay? And the fusion bands have to take that on board. But what's much more interesting is, is the influence of fusion on disco. So I've pulled out another band, right, here, that, that are, um, are, are, are almost equal to Earth in, in Wind and Fire in laying the foundations of disco to me, and that would be Call and the Gang. He is the best of Call of the Gang. So when we look at the early tracks on here, which would be like Funky Stuff, Open Sesame, Jungle Boogie, all those um, early tracks, they just really are in the style of P-Funk. Um, there's a ton of jazz fusion in there. Um, but as the 70s goes on, they start writing hit records. I'm thinking things like Set Ladies Night and Celebration. Right, so Earth, Wind and Fire and Cool The Gang for me are the, are the sort of P-Funk fusionist bands that then create the foundations of disco. Now, I've got a ton of disco albums. Right, but I've pulled out three, which I think have a huge dose of jazz fusion in them. So it's not the other way, it's not fusion albums, you know, we're not talking like Grover Washington or David Sanborn, which have been influenced by disco the other way. We're talking about, you know, incredible disco albums that have um, some great playing on and some the influence from jazz fusion. So the first one I pulled out is uh, The Brothers Johnson, okay? So this is uh, called Looking Out for Number One. It, create, it, it contains some incredible songs. Thunder Thumbs and Lightning Licks, Get the Funk Out of My Face. Right, they do a brilliant version of the Beatles come together. See how we got another Beatles cover? That's the key here. You take the P-Funk, straighten it up, and then bring the Beatles in, and you start to get, um, you know, disco albums. This is halfway between disco and funk, and of course, this is produced by Quincy Jones. Quincy Jones is the great jazz arranger, you know. And here he is now producing disco albums, all right? Um, these two guys, and you know, George Johnson and um, Louis Johnson, guitar and bass, and especially Louis Johnson on bass, this is some serious playing on here. Uh, this is a funky album, okay? Right, 
Disco masterpiece coming up now. Two disco masterpieces. I absolutely love these albums. The first is Heat Wave. All right, Too Hot to Handle by Heat Wave. And this is uh, being put together by Rod Temperton, another genius. There they are. This is this is just like a masterpiece. These two albums, of course, Rod Temperton and Quincy Jones are going to go on at the end of the seventies to create one of the greatest disco albums of all time. But before we get there, I just wanted to pull this one out. Chic, you know, um, freak out, um, not freak out, le freak. <laughs> I've got Zapper in there. So, um, Bernard Edwards on bass, Nile Rodgers on, on guitar, and Tony Thompson on drums. Um, I'm hugely influenced by Tony Thompson. Uh, these, this album, and then, and then his work um, with David Bowie and uh, Power Station, especially the Power Station album in the 80s. When I heard his drumming on that, it just... It just absolutely blew me the way that his his way of playing grooves are just so incredible. So Tony Thompson's a huge influence on me. This is a, of course is a Brit. Everyone knows this. You know, Noel Rogers is still there, cutting edge of popular music right now. You know, over forty years later. But all this is leading to this album, which I'm going to finish with on this video. And of course, it's Michael Jackson off the wall. Okay, so. Um, I really think this is another one of the greatest albums of all time. All the albums I've I've covered on this video and the previous video, I've every time I've been picking out jazz fusion albums, I've happened to jump through all these funk albums. There's a whole ton of funk and disco albums in there. And I've been jumping past and thinking, I've got to represent this because there's a reason why it's all there. The influence on me is huge. The the line between jazz fusion and funk and disco is is tenuous. You know, I, I move between the two and this here. I think it's one of the greatest albums of all time and I needed to talk about it on my channel. Um, Michael Jackson, of course, we all know, you know, came through the Jackson 5, which is a, a pop, you know, almost like a pop band influenced, you know, indirectly by James Brown and, and, and P-Funk. You can hear it's in there. Um, as the 70s hack progress, that commercialism mixed with his funky sound, he starts to make... Um, disco records I think with Jackson's uh, Blame It on the Boogie is one of the great disco records uh, but he, he never quite nails it he's had some solo career um, but he wants to make a statement he wants to become the greatest black artist of all time all right um, and I say that for a reason uh, so he drafts in Quincy Jones now what's interesting the labels thought that Quincy Jones was too jazzy there we go you know he was too jazzy to uh, produce um, Michael Jackson, but all that jazz and fl fusion influence comes in on this. You know, all the stuff we've been um, talking about. They bring Rod Temperton in. So if you take that she, um, sorry, if we take that um, Heatwave album and the Brothers Johnson, album, we put them together. That's the blueprint for this album here, right? He drafts in a whole ton of players. Okay, on this album, let's let's see, and it's it's an incredible lineup of people. So we've got Louis Johnson on bass from the Brothers Johnson, John Robinson on drums on the opening track. Um, we've got Randy Jackson on percussion, Paulino da Costa percussion, uh, horns arranged by Jerry Hay, you know. Um, we've got, um, if I just go through, um, who else have we got? Uh, Greg Fillingies, Michael Bodica. We've got, um, let's have a look. Philip Church, um, we've got um, Wawa Watson. Now what I'm doing here is pulling out all the musicians that crop up on our fusion albums, and there's a whole ton of them. Um, George Duke's on here. Um, who else is on here? Steve Picaro, Dave Foster, um, Larry Williams. These are all musicians that you will find on various jazz fusion albums. So I think, my point is, is this album, right, is almost a summation of everything that's happened in jazz fusion up until that point. Of course, this album comes out and propels Michael Jackson to the forefront of the sort of disco black R&B world. He becomes a leader. 
Um, that's not enough for Michael Jackson. He actually wants to become the biggest artist in the world. And he's up against something. Because what he's up against is the fact that at the eight, as we enter the 80s, this is going to become a video age. You know, and the image is so important. And believe it or not, and this is only 40 years ago, in 1980, um, in the early 80s, uh, MTV will not show black artists. Um, they are really seeing themselves as a sort of white rock, you know, channel, and they won't put black artists on. Right, the, the guy that breaks that rule is actually um, Herbie Hancock with his track Rocket, which is an instrumental and very clever on the video. Um, Herbie Hancock's in the video, but he's on a television screen. Um, that album was, that album and that track was produced by Bill Laswell, who of course, by the 80s, is supporting all the P-Funk players, right? This is something that never gets mentioned is that Off The Wall is a product of Jazz Fusion. It's Jazz Fusion that then opens the door to um, this music, especially Michael Jackson. And Michael Jackson steps in, and he steps in with Thriller, which then becomes the biggest album of all time. And if you go and check out the um, players on that, again, it's a who's who of Jazz Fusion. But there's an extra element. I'm going to finish this, this video with this story. There's an extra element to that um, uh, album. They recorded the songs and Quincy Jones' production style was that he was not put, a, he was not going to put a, a track that wasn't a hit. Right, so they scrapped a lot of tracks, they brought new tracks in and they wrote those. And one of the things they realized is to get crossover to MTV, they needed to bring in a subtle rock sound. Right, there's two breakthroughs on, on, on Thriller. One is um, the rock sound that's been brought on, especially on um, Beat It. And the other one is, is videos that actually don't really make sense on their own. Sorry, songs that don't make sense on their own, but only make sense when you put them with the video. Thriller is actually quite a bonkers song to appear on the biggest album ever made. But the reason why it works is because it's going to be put with a video. The videos are very important. Um, the rock sound um, on um, Beat It, well, the riffs are provided by, I think, Steve Lukath from Toto, which I mentioned before. But the guitar solo is by Eddie Van Halen, and this is a really uh, bold move by Michael Jackson. When um, Eddie Van Halen got the call that he, um, he was going to play on Thriller, he wanted the perfect guitar tone. So... Um, he rings up his mate Alan Holdsworth <laughs> and I'm pretty sure, and this story is, I, I've been told, I don't know whether it's true or not, that uh, the guitar solo for um, Beat It was played by Eddie Van Halen through Alan Holdsworth's um, amp, through his rig, to try and get the Holdsworth sound. Of course we know the Holdsworth sound. He's uh, in Alan's hands, but what's interesting is, is that when you listen to the solo on Beat It particularly, without a doubt, even if that story's not true, and I'm pretty sure it is, but even if it's not, um, he's channeling Holdsworth. So I have just given you three or four examples of the influence of Jazz Fusion on not only disco, but on the making of the biggest album in the world that was then going to influence all popular music after that. So I have come to the end of my video part two of um, my history of 70s funk. 70s funk's pretty important. It's a huge influence. I've been able to talk about a whole ton of albums that I haven't been able to talk about and I hope you enjoyed it. If you like this, then like it. If you uh, wanna see more, subscribe. And of course, now I'm slowly building up another ton of weirder and wackier videos over on my Patreon. At the moment, I've got 27 videos up there. I started in the um, end of February putting them up and it's ever growing and I get a lot more weirder and a lot more stranger. Also on the Patreon, I've got like um, loads of free albums and downloads and a whole ton of other stuff as well. And we chat and a lot of the ideas that come from here are coming from some of the people I'm chatting over on Patreon. So if you wanna you know, support me and you know, I would love it if you could, you know, pop over to Patreon. Um, that's it. I'm done. I think I'm done. I'm not going to do any more. So we're done. Are we done? I think so. Do you feel funky? I do. Let's go and get funky. Thank you very much. Bye.